to Who the Fuck Are I Tit Monkeys, the podcast where we chat to interesting people about their favourite song from the titular lads from High Green as well as much more. This week I'm joined by Ben Chappell. He's a music video director and frequent collaborator of the group since all the way back in 2011 when he began working with them on the Suck It and See videos. He's continued to work with the band since then, all the way through AM and into Tranquility Base Hotel and Casino, where he worked as not only the director for both music videos released surrounding that album, but also the creative director for the record as a whole. A role that involved him overseeing their BBC Made a Veil session, creating performance videos from South America in the Royal Albert Hall, and the documentary film Warp Speed Chic. But before all of that, he reveals his favourite track from his sixth album discography. Here's me and Ben Chappell, talking all things Art of Monkeys. I guess if I oddly had to pick a tune, it would be American Sports. I guess much like Alex Turner, I recently met our neighbor across the street and her name is Lola. And I also did not think I would meet so many Lolas in my life. Secondarily from that, I truly love sports. (laughs) Uh, So American sports are right up my alley. It's got a very beefy riff, that one. I kind of, it's slightly Beatles on your side to it. Yeah, it's a cool tune. Yeah. It's interesting because you were kind of, I mean, for the process of that record, Tranquility Bass, you were really in from quite early on working with the band, right? I was, yeah. Al did a lot of it at his house to start with. And like the fellas came around and they recorded a bunch of stuff like just in his like spare room. And I started coming around just like hanging out, hearing some tunes. And then we started talking about all the space stuff. And, and then he started building this like model, which is on the album cover. And he would just be like up all night for nights doing this like cutting cutting like poster board and gluing little things together and there were different iterations of it so then we started like taking photos with that and kind of like just kind of trying to create some visual ideas and yeah so it was it was a fun process a lot of movies a lot of like 70s sci-fi movies that we were kind of always talking about and then ended up referencing in a lot of the visuals that we created and a bunch of the lyrics on the record are very that so yeah it was a whole world yeah and i was i went over to france with them when they were recording at la frette we shot some stuff and it was cool very cool to see it all come together so were you in were you still living in la at the beginning of this process yes yeah i moved to nashville my wife and i moved to nashville like about a year and a half ago So yeah, uh, Alex and I live pretty close to each other. So when we were kind of really getting into the meat and potatoes of doing all the editing and stuff like that, I would just go around his every day and we'd get into it. So we did a bunch of stuff like, it seems like ages ago now, but all the lyrics, we like made these transparencies at Kinko's and took photos of them. And that became all the artwork or all the sort of booklet and stuff in the record. and. But yeah, it's interesting. You touched upon the reference points a few moments ago, and you know the Kubrickian thing often gets brought up. I was intrigued though. Was there any reference to James Bond? Because I get real kind of you know like Moonraker and You Only Live Twice vibes from a lot of the videos. Yeah, there wasn't really any James Bond. Um, not really much Bond. Definitely Kubrick, and and definitely God, my mind is blank. I just have to look up a title. The samurai and stuff as well. Yeah, a bit of that, definitely, yeah. Were these reference points that you were familiar with prior to kind of working on the the creative design for the record? A little bit, but not um, not as much as they probably should have been. I think, you know, like most people, you see a load of movies in your early 20s that you've then forgot by your 30s. <laughs> so Al was like watching a ton of movies during that whole period in time. So... It was a. It was just kind of like you know. Hey, have you seen this? And I'd be like, uh, maybe. And then I'd watch it, and then we'd talk about it, and it was a lot of a lot of back and forth of that. But yeah, I mean, all the classic stuff. I don't know. It's it's kind of like uh, it's all sort of mashed together, where it'd be a you know a shot from from one thing sort of referenced in an outfit or something. You know, like it not not much of it's like totally like overt. It's very 
it's all just sort of all gets burned. Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I think it was just kind of a world, you know. It's like uh, all these things were like we never really had any mood boards or actual little literal references. It was just tons of watching stuff and talking and talking and talking and and creating sets of rules for things and how we moved the camera and how we used the light and. I mean, I think the one we did for the Tune Tranquility Base Hotel and Casino is pretty much the culmination of everything kind of coming together. We went up and scouted. So that was all shot in Reno, Nevada, which is a little bit off the beaten path from like, you know, where things, everybody shoot, a lot of people shoot in Vegas and, you know, you can, there's some obvious places to shoot that kind of stuff, the vintage casino thing. But um, up there, it was like we just went to like every single casino across that whole area and picked out certain rooms that felt right. And then sort of like spent a couple hours in every room shooting stuff and then putting it all together kind of created its own little world. Which, which did finally feel sort of correct. It kind of rem- it reminds me a little bit, I don't know if this would be a fair comparison to make, but the Suck It and See videos you did for Suck It and See itself, and was it Hellcat Spangled Shalala when he's escaping from prison? Uh, that is a funny one. That one I t- is... I feel like they take place in the same world in a similar kind of way, if you know what I mean. Yeah. What tune is that for? Oh, it's for uh, Black Treacle. Yeah, is that's it? the one. Yeah. Because we did the one for Suck It and See where it's mostly all Matt. There's a sliver of Al in there. And then, yeah, and then it kind of got a lot more far out with the Black Treacle video. It's wild. Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, I, I think they're the same in that we sort of created a world and then, and then everything we you know, made was, was within that world. Would you have conversations about the characters they're playing within that world? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the stuff back on Suck It and See, uh, Matt was just really keen and into just like doing wild stuff. Uh, and he wanted to like, they had all just gotten their motorcycle licenses in America or I guess in, over there. But, um, and I, I had also, we all kind of moved to LA at the same time. I was living in Chicago previously. And then I think like 2011, 2012, I moved there in 2011. I think they came shortly after, but we had already met. Um, during the recording of Second and See. But yeah, I don't know. They were just sort of like up for doing whatever and all were into motorbikes at the time. So that's how we sort of started on the path of doing the video with Matt being a sort of <laughs> uh, outlaw... Convict. Guy. Convict, yeah. Um, some There was a lot of like Lemmy in that period. Mm, yeah. And uh, I think some of it was like trying to like sort of reference lemmy in a weird way when you're working on videos like it's interesting because if we look at you know the suck it and see videos for example yeah i think you have five videos in that album campaign and then for am it's the same again but you direct three of those tranquility base you only have two but you do all this kind of other stuff where you have the warp speed sheet documentary you have live in mexico you have the the made avail session was that kind of discussed early on that you wanted to maybe go in some different directions and bring in some other stuff that was still video based, but not a music video per se? Not really. I think back on Suck It and See, it was just like, we were all hanging out a ton and it was just really fun to make videos. So it was just like, hey, let's do this, you know, whatever video it was at the time. I think those all came quite effortlessly and were just sort of happening. Um, our good friend Aaron Brown and I did almost all that stuff together. And um, we kind of operated as just like a tiny two man crew. Like I would shoot stuff, Aaron would shoot stuff, we'd run around and just make stuff. It wasn't quite as thought out or like planned. Uh, AM got a lot more, there were a lot of different directors that worked on a lot of different videos. And, um, and so that kind of had a bigger swath of of stuff from the do i want to know uh animated video yeah and then we did one for one for the road with a bunch of crazy tractors (laughs) and even that is just kind of that video was just like talking to alex one day and he was like what if or he was saying like 
what if we made a video where Jamie drove a tractor? And that was basically the impetus of the whole video. I grew up in like the country in Iowa and Illinois, and they do these crazy hot rod tractor tractor poles where you get a super heavy like trailer and then everybody sees how far they can pull the trailer with a certain amount of weight so anyway that was just that just like a really weird thing and once i started pulling some imagery and telling them about it they all got into it so we went out there and did that video but yeah i don't know uh i I think the tranquility stuff it just you know everybody's a little a little older now and i feel like we just tried to focus on making stuff that made sense for the concept of the record and i don't think that was ever going to be like five videos i think we at one point we were going to make a third one but i don't exactly remember how that went down but once they start touring it just gets really sort of hectic with schedules and you know there might be a day off here or there but it's sort of these other things we spent a lot of time on the four out of five video Alex and Aaron and I went up there and we were actually staying at that castle and were there for like a week planning stuff and working stuff out together. And then we shot properly for two days. Uh, and a lot of times music videos, you get like, maybe you get eight hours with the band and like, that's it. So this was, and the same thing with Reno, Alex came up and yeah, we all just stayed up there for a while and we're just able to shoot with a tiny crew and get a lot of, a lot of shooting done in, uh, over across multiple days so i think to put that much effort into it when they're on the road is a lot tougher um just with schedules and stuff so you've also set an expectation from those first two videos yeah i think if we would have had some you know and we did have a few other concepts for other stuff but it just never kind of we just never got it all together the thing about the uh made avail you know we were able with, with the stage show you know, we were using some of these old cameras as the cameras for the the screens, you know, on the side of the shows. And we had the cameramen dressed in like red jumpsuits, or they might have been brown. I think they were red. Same ones that we used um, on the 4 out of 5 video. So we sort of like, that was part of the world was we made this TV studio inside of the castle. And then once the show went on the road, we had cameramen in red boiler suits, you know, operating the same cameras that we had in the video. And so that kind of tied the worlds together. And then when we did Made a Veil, we wanted to shoot the entire thing on old cameras and basically just make it look like a old gray whistle test or something. But the BBC wouldn't allow us to not broadcast HD. So we ended up making kind of a world within a world. So we had all our vintage cameras shooting the band and then we had HD cameras behind them shooting them shooting the band so <laughs> that was kind of how we got away with doing that it's almost like a truman show type thing yeah a bit of that a bit of that yeah so and, and that all just thematically kind of works in the world that we made you know i think it's it just all made sense and kind of came naturally after working on these ideas over you know like a couple of years you stayed in the four or five hours you said for a week before you started shooting something like that i think we were up there it was at Castle Howard in uh, Yorkshire. Barry London House. Yeah, yeah. I think we were up there. Yeah, I want to say I was up there for like a week. And then Alex came a couple days before we started shooting. And we kind of started working through everything. And then the crew came and then we did everything, I think over two days. And then Alex and I and um, our friend Mark Bull, who's done a lot of video stuff for the boys back in the day. He's one of their oldest friends. The three of us instantly the next morning flew to Munich, shot that scene in the orange tunnel. The kind of retro looking 70s train. It's almost like quite retro futuristic. Yeah, Yeah. it is. Yeah. And that was one of the things where it was like, once we started, I was sort of saying earlier, there was never like any like mood board of any kind, really. That was one thing was where it was a, Alex at one point was just like looking through all these crazy train station pictures and sending them around. And that was one that just like kept popping out. So, so we went and shot that (laughs) in a sort of, in a haze of just, we had just shot for two days. So it was like really intense and it was like instantly get on the plane and, and do that. Yeah. So, but it was, it was cool. It all came together against all odds. That week of prep work that you had at the house how does your 
your feel and your understanding of what the video is going to be develop and evolve in that week of preparation? Well, we had these like ideas about there being like two two Alex's and it really was just uh, a friend a friend of ours was like it'd be funny if there was like one scene where you had the beard and another one where you didn't and I don't think he had ever had facial hair before so we shot for like a day with the facial hair and then I think we shaved him and then the next day was without so we kind of were playing this two character idea and we knew there was going to be a sort of a TV studio within the castle and and that was a cool aesthetic and then a lot of it was just informed on what was around the castle. So there was, we got loads of, you know, funky old equipment and put it around and we got a horse. I don't know. It's just, <laughs> it, it just, it kind of was like a lot of that video was just inspired by the location and a lot of wandering around. And there's a dog in the video and the dog is just one of the groundskeepers or maintenance guys there. And the dog was just always there when we were there and he was just a really cool dog. So we put the dog in the video and, and then that model, the sort of model that's on the cover, Domino had this guy remake it because we couldn't get the one that Alex made over from LA to there. It just would have been impossible. So they commissioned this guy to actually to remake it. So we had one, uh, we had one in the, so we could have one in the video. So that was, that was cool. They, and then they had a model of the castle there as well. So that was sort of like, I don't know. It's just, I think we'd, we'd been living in this, conceptual mental world for a long time so actually being in that space was really inspiring and we were able to kind of like just run around and come up with ideas and I mean, at the end of the day it's a music video it's not a you know we're not really a tonic of a, a madness here like it's it's you know we're not we're not telling a deep intricate story but there are definitely some story beats that we hit and it must be funny, you know, when you spend so long working on conceiving that world and suddenly you're living in it, you know, you're actually staying in the house itself. Yeah, it was cool. Um, one of the things we did early on was we had had some, we had had a camera that we wanted to play with this 35 millimeter two perf. It's like what they used to shoot the spaghetti Westerns on. So it's like a, it's a tall and it's a long and skinny frame, you know, like a cinemascope look. But it shoots, it's, it's, it just uses spherical lenses and it just shoots little skinny strips on film. So you can actually fit a ton more footage on the film. So we got one in LA for a day. Helders came over to Alex's and we just made a, a music video for 4 out of 5 in the garage at, at Alex's and tried a bunch of stuff. And we had a camera and a projector and, and a drum kit and a guitar. And it was just like literally just, you know, us in the garage with a couple lights or whatever. And that video oddly informed a bunch of the of the camera moves and sort of the the things that we ended up doing in the big video at the castle. So there was that was kind of like the test shoot. So making a demo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we made a demo in the garage and then and then went to the big house and shot it. So it, I think sort of it uh, that whole record that whole vid, all the visuals for that record are very just a long churning process that came to be. It, it wasn't anything that was like super planned to the T. It was a very improvisational process through this set of references and rules that we created for ourselves. Yeah. I mean, I guess once you put those rules down and you create that world, you've constructed quite a nice space for yourself to improvise within. Definitely. And it won't get too chaotic. The walls are there but you have enough space to play. Exactly. And it's, you know, editing was, we probably made like 24 versions of four out of five before we kind of got to the final cut. So there's a lot of nuanced editing in those things that a lot of the rules, you know, kind of you create a second set of rules. So that, that, that was, yeah. That, oh man, I just remember editing those forever. <laughs> <laughs> How many edits for Warp Speed Chic? That one, not as many. That one started as just like, so I had gone over, spent like 10 days or so while they were at Lafrette and I shot a bunch of footage and we didn't really know what to do with it. But um, around, I think right after the record was released, they did this like sort of gallery pop-up thing. Yeah, I remember those. Yeah. Yeah. So I do a lot of the video stuff and there's a guy who does a lot of the photo stuff, Zachary Michael. He had a bunch of just great photos. He came along to um, the Tranquility Base Hotel and Casino shoot in Reno. So he had some cool photos from that. 
he was also at Lafrette. And so he had just a ton of great photos. Then they had the model that we had made from the video. And there was like a lower level to the gallery. So then the idea was like, let's make a little film to play down there. So that's what Warp Speed Chic was, um, was I just kind of cobbled together all of the footage from the studio. And then I had gone to a few shows and actually seen some of the tunes being performed and was able to cut those together. And that kind of, yeah, kind of worked out as like a nice little overview of the whole album. James Ford made some really nice uh, instrumental mixes for us. So I got to use all those, which was cool. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating because you almost feel like you're seeing the moment in which the the song is conceived, like this tiny intimate thing, and then you cut from that to the impact that it has in a live setting when you have this crowd reacting to it. It's quite powerful. It is, yeah. And it was fun for, you know, I mean, I was a part of the process, but, it, you know, not being a musical part of the process, just seeing that actually happen was cool to see him from, you know, Alex's spare room in the basement to, you know, 50,000 people or whatever is wild. Crazy, yeah. How would, uh, how would you compare the atmosphere of the studio to the atmosphere of a set? Very similar. Very similar. Both of which you do a lot of sitting around and drinking coffee. <laughs> um, but no, I think uh, this record for them was cool because they did a lot of everybody was just in the room, which I think you see some of that in that Warp Speed Chic, like pretty much everything's just, they're all just like in this, in the room playing. And it's very uh, real. I mean, there's a bunch of overdubs and stuff too, but I think it's like in that studio, particularly it was like the control room is like down in the basement and then everybody's just kind of in this big old house. You know, when James Ford calls action, everybody sort of does their thing. And so it was, a, it is a lot like, like the, like, like being on set and then, you know, doing tiny, tiny overdubs for things is a lot like shooting close ups, you know, for coverage. Um, so yeah, it is, it's, it's very similar. And especially there, that place, the fret, everything looks cool. And I don't know, it's just, it's, it's also very homey. That's another place everyone was staying there. So the studio just has like living quarters in it. So you're in the world, you know, you wake up and ha yeah, you wake up and have breakfast together every morning and wine every night. So it's just like a very, a very nice world to be in. How long were you there for? I think I was there for 10 days or two weeks, but they were there for probably like three weeks or something. And then how long did you go on tour with when you, it was a live in Mexico thing, right? Uh, yeah. I, I don't really tend to go on full tours that much. I did South America a number of years ago with them, but uh, I've done on this last round, Leon, France. We did uh, shot a bunch of stuff for that. That's some of the stuff that's in Warp Feed Chic. And then the Royal Albert Hall show and Mexico. And I kind of just am more, if there's a big show and it makes sense for me to be around with the camera, I'll come in and do that. Oh, I was at a bunch of the O2 shows. There were like three or four O2 arena shows in London. And they were up for a Mercury prize. I think that the gigs were, they couldn't do like the performance at the show. So we shot uh, during soundcheck one point perspective for them, then that got broadcast on Mercury prize. So a lot of little things like that when there's sort of, and the made avail thing was the day before the Royal Albert hall show. So I was over there doing the made avail thing anyway, and then stayed an extra day to do Albert hall. And then, the, I, I mean, nobody really knew that was going to end up being a live record, but it ended up happening. Shooting something like the Royal Albert Hall, how much of those shots are conceived in spontaneity in the moment and how much have you pre-planned before going into it? You know, a lot of the stuff that I do with them is just, I just have one camera and I'm just by myself. So not much. I generally pick a few tunes that I want to shoot and then I just run around with them and, and shoot them. The Royal Albert Hall video, we did a live video for Arabella. That's actually <laughs> entirely a performance from France. That's not footage from the Royal Albert Hall show. Only because to shoot at the Royal Albert Hall, it's, 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 a, whole, it's a whole massive process. So I shot some stuff at the soundcheck that day, but not anything at the show um, per se. So when it came around to making that video, I had had a really good Arabella from France 
And I just, you know, made it work, slipped and slide. And where it wasn't in sync, we used cutaways and stuff. And so that was kind of a place where I just used a bunch of live footage from across the entire campaign to create a live video. It reminds me a bit of the 4 out of 5 video, though, where you have the sensation of there being multiple Alexes and multiple members of the band in it, because you're kind of cutting between the various performances. Yeah, definitely, because people have, di- like, somehow this cycle, everybody changed their hair a lot, especially Alex. So he has, like, a <laughs> shaved head at one point, and then he has long hair, and then he has a, you know, like a goatee beard thing going on for a bit. So, yeah, this, it was a lot of that. Yeah, that is, that's true. Never thought about that. In the time that you've been working with them, you know, over... I mean, probably 10 years now, thereabouts. Yeah, yeah. You know, they've obviously kind of changed quite a lot as a band going through these various styles across the records and growing, you know, in terms of artistically and both commercially. For you as a director, how have you evolved over the same time span? I think, you know, when we started out, make Aaron and I started out making videos with them, it was really kind of like I was saying earlier, it was just quite like fun. It was just like making stuff with your friends we had these little digital cameras and we'd run around and do whatever. Like the Are You Mine video is sort of a good example of that. They were in LA for a while and they had rented this like massive Chevy Suburban, which is like a really big SUV. And we were just always rolling around in that thing. And then we talked about like doing a video and we came a million ideas. And then it finally came around to like, what if we just shot it inside this car? So we messed around over a couple of days in a parking lot and kind of getting all the moves down and then set up a shoot for the nighttime and i think we shot the entire thing in like an hour and then went and had beers so it was very like let's just have fun and make stuff and then now you know we're getting cool fancy film cameras and you know renting castles and things it's all a bit more methodical and thought out with a bit more purpose than it was when we started doing stuff. And, you know, their music probably is similar to that in some ways. Tuckin' and See is kind of a, uh, you know, they're just the four of them are in the room. You know, it's got cool tunes, but sonically it's sort of just that. And if you think about like the newest record, the Tranquility record, it's just there's so many layers of so many different sounds and stuff. So I, I think it's sort of visually we've kind of done a lot of those same things where we've added a lot more depth to the concepts and the visuals than sort of sitting in an SUV and passing a camera around to each other. 